made her intentions known to Boaz that she would like to become his wife. Boaz was pleased with this proposal, blessing her in the name of the Lord. He said he would do whatever she asked. However, there was a relative closer than Boaz. This relative had the right to redeem her first. Boaz said if the relative wished to redeem her, good. But if not, as the Lord lives, he would redeem her. Boaz wouldn't waste any time finding out. He told Ruth he would learn the outcome when morning comes. Both Boaz and Ruth are eager to see what happens. Let's find out ourselves. I'm in Ruth chapter 4 verse 1 reading from the New American Standard Version. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there and behold the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. As promised, Boaz takes care of business. He is at the gate where business is done, watching for the close relative. And are we surprised that the close relative is passing by? God is all in this. He is faithful in the details. Imagine if Boaz's report at the end of the day was, I was at the gate, even went to look for him. I don't know where the guy was. No, the Lord is making sure the matter is decided quickly. Boaz lines up his witnesses. He is ready to proceed. Continuing verse three, then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So this is great. The close relative is willing to do his duty. He's willing to buy the land so the inheritance can stay in the family. This will also help Naomi financially. That matter is resolved quickly. But can you imagine Boaz's countenance? Like, great, fantastic. But Boaz has something more. Continuing verse five, then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption for I cannot redeem it. The close relative had to know about Ruth. Boaz spoke of her reputation in the city as a woman of excellence. And this is family. He's the closest kinsman to them. But he apparently thought he could deal with these matters separately. Buy the land and leave Ruth to marry someone else. Boaz in front of witnesses says, if you're going to be the kinsman redeemer, you need to redeem both the land and the widow of Malin the deceased relative. The relative says, now you're messing with my inheritance. I am not willing to go that far. And he knows that Boaz apparently is willing to redeem both. So it's a win-win. He says, you may have my right of redemption. Boaz is like, gladly. Continuing verse seven. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malin. 
Moreover, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malin, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. I love that Boaz said he was acquiring Ruth as his wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. It's got nothing to do with my own personal fondness and affection for this woman of excellence. This is purely transactional, only fulfilling my duty here. Continuing verse 11, all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. The elders speak a blessing over Ruth and Boaz. They say, may the Lord make Ruth like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. Rachel and Leah were both wives of Jacob, who was also known as Israel. Rachel was the wife he loved, her sister Leah, not so much. But Leah is the one who bore Judah. Judah is mentioned in verse 12, Tamar bore Perez to Judah. This is from Genesis 38, very involved story. Tamar also was a widow. She was married to Judah's oldest son. He was evil in the Lord's sight and the Lord took his life. Judah told the next son, Onan, to perform his duty as a brother-in-law and raise up offspring for his brother. Onan didn't want to do it. He goes into Tamar, but he wastes his seed on the ground and the Lord took his life. Judah told Tamar, okay, wait until my third son grows up and I will give you to him as a wife but Judah really didn't want to do that because he was afraid that son would die as well. So Tamar pretended to be a harlot and slept with her father-in-law, Judah. She had twins and the firstborn was Perez. The important thing to note is that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, descended through Perez, which is Boaz's lineage. Continuing verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. In the time Ruth was married to Malin, she did not conceive any children. Now with Boaz, right away, the Lord enables her to conceive and bear a son. Continuing verse 14, then the women said to Naomi, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. The focus of the narrative switches from Boaz and Ruth to Naomi and specifically the women and Naomi. In chapter one, when Naomi returned from Bethlehem, the conversation there was between the women and Naomi. Remember the women said, is this Naomi? And Naomi replied, chapter one, verses 20 and 21, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So at that time, that was Naomi's testimony to the women. Now it's the women telling Naomi, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. 
May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. These women remember where Naomi was, how her affliction had left her bitter, literally from Naomi's own mouth. And they say, look what God did. Let's praise him. He didn't forget you. He had you in mind all along. When Naomi said the Lord had left her empty, she didn't acknowledge that the Lord had given her Ruth, whom she had tried to send back. The women make a point of telling Naomi, Ruth loves her and is better to her than seven sons. A reminder to Naomi of the goodness of God just in that, in giving her Ruth. The women also are the ones who name this boy Obed. And here this little line is slipped in. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. It's like, wait, what? Ruth and Boaz are David's grandparents? Then it's like, well, no wonder. Of course, their remarkable story would relate to King David. I mean, God is sovereign no matter who's involved, but you know that you know he's going to be sovereign over the genealogy of Jesus. When we read this line about Jesse and David, the entire book of Ruth turns a little as we understand a little better. Okay, Ruth gets the notion to go glean. She happens into Boaz's field. He shows her extraordinary favor. Naomi comes up with a plan to get Ruth and Boaz together. The closest kinsman refuses to redeem her, paving the way for Boaz to marry her. All God's sovereignty, all part of God's plan and purpose, but we even see his sovereignty in the affliction, in Naomi losing her husband and sons, Ruth being unable to bear children to Malin and losing her husband, them having to return as widows with Naomi feeling empty and forgotten, all part of God's plan and purpose as he set up the lineage from which Jesus would descend when he came down to earth. Continuing verse 18, now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram Amminadab, and to Amminadab was born Nashan, and to Nashan Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse David. Let's read this genealogy in Matthew 1, beginning at verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. It's like, so wait, 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 wait. Let me go back with my highlighter. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, we get another amazing nugget about this man, Boaz. His mother is Rahab. Rahab was the Canaanite harlot who hid the two spies that Joshua sent when they were about to overtake Jericho. Look what Rahab said to the two spies. Joshua 2, 9 through 13. This is Boaz's mom. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, 
that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. When Joshua and the people of Israel conquered Jericho, Rahab the harlot, as she was called, was spared. Look at Joshua 6.25. After they had utterly destroyed the city, it says, However, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. For she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Rahab is also mentioned in Hebrews 11:31. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Rahab was a woman of faith. Is it any surprise that she raised a son who became a man of faith? Is it any surprise that Boaz would welcome and have such a heart for a foreigner? Given that his own mother had once been a foreigner in the midst of the people of Israel. And how amazing is our God that he would purposefully place these two women, Rahab the harlot and Ruth the Moabitess, in the lineage of Jesus and that they would be mentioned by name in the book of Matthew. The book of Ruth is such a beautiful story of the love and sovereignty of God and of what it looks like to cling fiercely to him as Ruth and Boaz did. And it also shows us that even when we aren't clinging fiercely, even when we start to lose a grip like Naomi did, God is still clinging to us. God is still faithful to us. He didn't forget Naomi. He doesn't forget us. He restores and sustains us. I pray that through this book, you see the kindness of God, the favor of God, and the faithfulness of God. I pray you see how mindful he is of our lives, down to the smallest details of our lives. I pray you see his sovereignty and how he works all things together for good. I pray you see him as a mighty redeemer. May this book cause us to cling fiercely to our loving and faithful God.